H. Lee Barnes, thank you very much for, uh, for joining us for this discussion. And at the end of your book, in, in, your after, in the afterword of your book, When We Walked Above the Clouds, um, the second person you mentioned is, is Andrew Brassfield. You write, Andrew Brassfield, whose tour at Trabong was brief, remains missing in action, one of more than a thousand Americans still left unaccounted for from the Vietnam War. Um, what are your memories of, of Andrew, and, and what, what do you know, I mean, about, I mean, what can you tell us about him, and then what do you know about what happened? Well, I really don't know. I'll finish that. I, I really don't know what happened, how he ended up becoming an MIA. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think he did leave Trabong after I left. I don't think it occurred while he was at Trabong. He was brought on as an assistant intelligence uh, sergeant. Yeah. Uh, he was uh, same rank I was. I, uh, he was either an E4 or an E5 uh, at the time, a Spec 4, Spec 5. Yeah. And he came in after I'd been there about five or six months. Uh, it was just about the same time that we got Holman, the uh, team, that new team sergeant in there. And uh, I don't think that Andrew actually ever went out with me on uh, patrol or an operation, but we made a connection just because we were the, roughly the same age. Mm. And, uh, we had we had two pieces of music at the at the camp that we could listen to. We could either listen to well, actually three. There was a Johnny Cash uh, record and a, a Buck Owens record, and then there was the Supremes. Yeah. And everybody else played Pinochle, but we had uh, we had uh, a chessboard, and Andrew and I played chess. So we would sit there when we had the opportunity to listen to the Supremes and. And uh, and play chess, and uh, this is of course when we weren't on operations or or when something sure. else wasn't going up the camp. Yeah. And uh, I think it kind of aggravated the older guys in in camp because here's these two young guys over there just by themselves, and they they yeah. wanted to hear Johnny, sure they wanted to hear Buck Owens, and uh, not and the Supremes. We liked the Supremes, yeah, because yeah. we were that generation. Right. Yeah. What What was he like as a person? Uh, he was he was really pleasant. He was smart. Uh, yeah. He was he was uh, probably an inch two inches taller than me. Uh, he was uh, uh, he was a black man. Uh, yeah. uh, I don't know what his background was. I don't even know how he ended up in special forces because we didn't really have uh, slots for an assistant hmm. intelligence. I think he I think he probably. Uh, went through some kind of uh, training in intelligence and then was transferred over from an, another unit into special yeah. forces. Yeah. Is there, when you... Um, you have to remember, we didn't talk about personal things. So, I, I mean, I, I, I didn't know anything about his family mm. uh, or anything like that. I assumed that he came from a really good family, though, because he, he, was, and he, was, he was smart. Yeah. Uh, he was a chess player. Uh, sure. I let him win a couple of games. Yeah. Uh, is that something, this is something you, you mentioned in the memoir that, um, that, you know, on the one hand, you've got to work closely together, but on the other hand, at least once you mentioned, there is kind of a distance, at the same time, there's kind of a psychological distance that you keep because, you, you know, because you don't know if the next day this, you know, this person might not be with us anymore. Is is that is that why personal stuff doesn't come out, or I, I think to a large extent that that's that's part of it, and then of yeah. course the job itself demands a lot of uh, a lot of your time and your effort. Yeah. So that when you you just kind of unwind. Yeah. And uh, I don't think, especially at Trebong, because we lost people so early on and everything else. Yeah. Uh, and I, I was the, I was the last hanger on from the, from the group of Americans that went in there with the, when the Australians were there. So, yeah. uh, I, I was kind of leery about most of the newcomers. They, uh, and I had a couple of, dis uh, we'll talk about that later, I guess, yeah. at some other time, but yeah. a couple of disappointing experiences with, with newcomers. Yeah. So, yeah. Brassfield was a good, and I, I, 
I don't have any idea what kind of he must. They must have attached him to. Uh, I'm guessing something like uh, uh, Project B52 or or Delta or one of those, and that's probably where he ended up. Uh, uh, Would this be across the border in Laos? Uh, it could be. I I don't know. Yeah. And and we may not know until his remains are recovered, and let's yeah. hope that they do. Let me um, ask you this: When you, of course, you 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 know you know guys, and you write about guys in your memoir who who didn't make it home. Uh, I mean, who didn't survive the war, but their remains were recovered. And then there's there's Andrew, um, who you know whose remains weren't covered, weren't, her, whose remains weren't recovered. Does that make any difference? to you when you think of the loss, but we, we're here we're talking about two general categories of the loss, the lost and recovered, the lost and the not recovered. When you, when you look back on, on that, does it, does it make a difference in your mind? Yes, I think it's the, uh, the notion that you don't leave your people behind. Yeah, and we certainly wouldn't want to leave our people behind. I mean, I'm talking about the guys in special forces, and probably most most combat units feel exactly the same way. But we're we're because we're such a small unit, we we're we're more concerned about everybody. Everybody wants you know, we want everybody else to go home with us. So yeah. there's a sense of closure. I think I I wrote a short story called What Remains. Mm -hmm. uh, I yeah, and and it was about it was about exactly that, a, a father, a father get, finally getting his son's remains and what it meant to that family, to him and specifically, uh, to have the son come home. And I think you know, Andrew has a mother and if she's yeah. still alive and a father, if he's still alive, or, or siblings, I can't recall because we didn't talk about family that way. Yeah. But for your sake, they, you know, certainly you want, the, you want the son to return and find and, and be, be buried in American soil. So I, I spent um, a couple weeks ago, I was in Honolulu at the base, Pearl Harbor Hickam, uh, with the um, Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency. And these are the folks who, whose job it is to go out and find what remains they can. Um, the, the story that most sticks in my mind, there was a group in Vietnam searching. In, in one week, they found a tooth and a medallion, and that was enough to identify the, the remains. Um, when I think about that, I think, okay, they have a tooth and a medallion, and then the, 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 the language is, you know, and so, you know, we bring the tooth and the medallion home, and so we've brought this soldier home. Which, you know, if you think about that literally, you know, a tooth and a medallion sort of standing in for the person. But does that make sense to you psychologically that, you know, of course after all these decades in that acidic soil of Vietnam, you're not gonna find very much, but, but we did find a tooth and we did find a medallion that we can identify with this guy. And in that sense, yes, those things are home, and therefore he's home. Does that make sense to you? Well, yeah, it kind of does. It answers the question because yeah. because until they come home, you don't know. Until they're found, you don't know. Uh, if I I think I just heard recently that somebody was identified from World War II. They're still the doing remains that. from. Yeah, yeah, they're still finding them, and uh, the and families families are 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 pleased that. Uh, that at least there's closure of uh, they know, they know what happened and where and uh, I, well we're we're people who follow traditions uh, and, and I, although there's there's a whole world of thought out there that would get rid of America's tradition of Judeo Christian background and everything else it still dominates a lot of the way that we're Americans are re reared yeah uh, in the family and yeah. and so. And so burial and uh, memorial services and all of those things yeah. uh, are, are part of what we do. And, yeah. and whether you believe in the afterlife or not, it's still yeah. part of our tradition. And, yeah. and we, we adhere to it wherever we can. We, we feel a spiritual connection with the dead. And the dead that 
the dead yeah. that we served with yeah. uh, as soldiers yeah. are even more important. The, yeah. just, it's, it's not like being a mother or a father, but it's close to being a brother or a sister. Yeah, yeah, that's what that's what really struck me. I mean, this this incredible commitment that we're you know we're four weeks into this thing and haven't found anything, and we keep going. And you know, at the end of at the end of five weeks, we've got a tooth and a medallion, but but we can positively identify those things. It it, it shows the depth of commitment to that person, you know, who is lost in war at that place, and and. You know, uh, it was it was it was really striking. Well, I appreciate you you sharing your memories and your thoughts about about Andrew. Um, as part of this uh, conversation, you know, we'll have his photograph and uh, and we'll have a little a little statement about what's known about what happened to him, just as a as a tribute to him. And we'll hope that um, you know, as time goes on, you know, slowly but surely, the you know. So, but surely the missing are, are being found, and so we'll hope that, that Andrew's among them in that time. Thanks. That's how I feel. Yeah, thank you.